Okay, so the next one that we have then is that we're going to move on and talk about carbon footprints. And what do we mean by carbon footprints? Well, according to Time for Change organization, carbon footprints can be defined as a carbon footprint is defined as the total amount of greenhouse gases produced to directly and indirectly support human activities, usually expressed in equivalent tons of CO2, All right, and CO2 being carbon dioxide. So what, how does that relate to food? Well, actually, food production is one of the biggest issues that we have with carbon increase and CO2 increase. And actually, not just CO2, methane as well. Now, we're not doing a class in chemistry. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. But now we've discovered that we're producing more and more methane, particularly with food waste and biological food waste. And methane is 20 times more powerful than carbon, carbon dioxide. All right. So even if it's, you know, worse form, it's 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And like that's an issue for the future. It might affect us today, but certainly into the future. So, but we hear an awful lot about carbon footprints, about airplanes and trucks and cars and, uh, you know, heating and electricity and fossil fuels and all that. Well, actually, an awful lot of it to do then is the production of food. That's from agriculture. So actually producing the food. Um, harvesting has a high carbon footprint. Um, how we we purchase, where we purchase from. So again, if we are, you know, designing dishes or having menus, and it's all food that's imported, uh, and we have to use imported food only, and we we're not looking at the local area or the national area of what we produce there. Well, actually, that increases the carbon footprint of your menu as well. So, you know, there's things that we can do to help. We may think that they're tiny and they don't make an effect. But if everybody did one thing, well, that's a major effect that we can have um, on reducing our carbon footprint. And um, in our industry in particular, hospitality, tourism, uh, culinary, cookery, um, carbon footprint is actually quite high across the board by its very nature. So there's little subtle things that we can do. And there's some amazing restaurants out there that are aiming for carbon neutral menus where they can or carbon neutral dishes or trying to uh, introduce renewable energies and uh, you know um, proper agricultural um, produce that's grown properly and that's in line with the environment again to offset this carbon issue carbon footprint issue that's out there uh, a lot of governments are using the carbon footprint to um, tax and that's their way of trying to encourage people is to um, tax it higher so that people will look towards a more local area. Um, and it's a way that can be done. You know, we can do it that way as well. And all of this fits into what we mean by a global food system. So global food security, uh, what does that mean? It's, it's sustainable, healthy food for all and everybody, not just for the privileged few, those of us that live in developed countries in particular. Um, and that can afford to eat us. Um, yes, we can afford to eat it. Yes, we're going to have it. Um, yes, we can eat healthier. Um, but the problem is, is that we have a billion people in the world that will be going hungry this evening. All right. So tonight when we're all having our supper or our dinner is that there's one billion people in the world that are going to bed with no food. And we may, we produce plenty food. We really do. So understanding that everything is interconnected and that we produce enough food and that's all part of the global food system which creates global food security for everybody so by us being intelligent in our kitchens or in our work or how we design something or prepare something and um, that helps in the long term we may not think of it every day that it helps but it actually helps in the long term so it does help the person that's going hungry tonight all right. It helps them not to be hungry tomorrow night if there's something that we can do about it in our daily job. So and that's why I say when contemporary chefs are developing dishes, the menus, it is vitally important that they now consider aspects of climate environmental change by utilizing environmental indicators as they pertain to their region. And that's very important because if we just think of this morning, here we are in a virtual room. It's Finland, Estonia the Basque Country and Ireland. 
Now, the Basque country in Ireland, you know, quite similar. The Basque country gets hotter summers, you know, which would be nice. Longer summer, which would be nice in Ireland. Don't get as much rain. Um, so quite different there. Uh, Finland is colder but drier, and Estonia the same way. Um, similar to a point that we're in northern latitudes, uh, but certainly colder and um, but drier, you know, not as wet as Ireland. Um, in Ireland, it rains six months of the year, fundamentally. That's how it does. So it's generally six months of the year. And um, so when we say pertain to their region, we also must take that into consideration. In Ireland, we have a different sort of climate than in Finland and Estonia and the Basque country. So it isn't one size fits all. We have to take into consideration where we are and where we are at that moment and uh, where... Um, you know, what's around us at that moment. Uh, and that's really, really important to understand when we talk about a global food system. Uh, the problem is today uh, is that we can guess it's still winter creeping into spring, we'll put it that way. So it's creeping into spring at the moment. But there's strawberries available. There's wild berries available. And um, these things shouldn't be available in our regions until uh, June, July, August, September. Yet I can go down to my local shop now and I can buy them here in Ireland. All right. And, you know, it's being conscious of that, especially in our professional career, because in a professional career, there's something that we can actually do about it. We can design things and we can create menus and dishes that don't have strawberries as part of it uh, in the middle of winter when they're off season, because those strawberries are being flown all the way from Egypt or from... Uh, Israel are from um, office in South Africa. Spain. And Spain, yeah. So Spain again as well, uh, particularly southern Spain um, and Portugal. And like they've been flown here off season. And again, it doesn't make sense. You know, it doesn't make sense. Um, seasons are there for a reason. You know, like there's nothing more exciting when I was growing up when I was younger. Um, nothing more exciting when strawberries, you know, were available. You know, you had them for July and August mainly, you know, maybe into September. But that was it. But you didn't see strawberries again until the following year. Whereas now, strawberries are just strawberries. I don't know the taste of strawberries anymore. Okay, so, and, and that's a, you know, that's the difference out there is that we can do something about that by not having strawberries on. And that's just one example. There's a variety of other stuff that's out there. There's plenty of examples out there for this. That's just one example. And then we talk about food waste, which is, again, a real big issue out there, guys. Um, we produce an awful lot of food waste, and particularly our industry. Um, the planet at the moment, for every 100 euro spent on food, 40 euro of it is thrown in a bin. So for every 100 euro spent, 40 euro is thrown in a bin. So you may as well just throw the 40 euro away, in other words. So we're buying all this food, we're not using it, we're throwing it away. That is an issue because that is unsustainable. No matter what way we look at it, if we ignore everything else, we can't ignore that. And that is absolutely unsustainable going forward. And it's been a major issue for many, many years now. So people are becoming more conscious of it, absolutely. And the businesses you will end up working in or the establishments you will end up working in are becoming more conscious of it because it costs money to get rid of it, all right? So even from a business decision, it's wise not to waste food and not to waste food to that level. So according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, food waste and food loss is incorporated into this as well, which is a slightly different thing, but they amount to the same idea that we just waste so much food. Food waste refers to the decrease in quantity or quality of food resulting from decisions and actions by retailers, food service providers, and consumers. So food waste is down to us as the individuals or as the establishments or as the um, organizations that we work for. It's not down to anything else. It's actually down to us. That's something that we can change at lunchtime today. You know, we don't have to waste 
for years to see. We can change that at lunchtime today, all of us in this room. There's something more that we can do uh, about reducing our food waste, all right, and trying not to waste food, particularly, um, I suppose, perishable foods is the big thing. So again, think about it yourselves, you know, this is just something to think about yourselves. You don't have to answer. If we think of the past month, how much food have we actually thrown away or that we didn't use? We bought it, but we didn't use it, so we ended up throwing it away. For various, it's gone off or it's, you know, it, it's not pleasant anymore or anything like that. Um, and again, that's part of it. We can change that. Okay, we can change that right now, today. That can be changed individually. And if everybody made that one change today, well, then we, we, we're on the pathway to solve the food waste problem. Because most food waste, when it is wasted, is also then dumped into landfill still. And that's then over time, over eons, that's creating uh, more and more methane gas or the potential for methane gas, which is released back into the atmosphere, which is a detrimental effect, effect because it it's, it's heats up the atmosphere more, which raises the temperature, which then has an effect on our ability to grow food in the long term. So it's a circle is what it is. And it's often been said that like there is no planet B. Like this is the planet we're on. We're in, there isn't a, a make your planet next door that we can all move to. You know, and no matter what we watch in the sci-fi movies, that's not going to happen. All right. And certainly not in the distant future either. Even in the distant future, that's not going to happen. All right, so we have to look after this planet as best we can, and it's up to us individually to do that. So, food is wasted in many ways, we understand that. Fresh produce that deviates from what it's considered optimal, for example, in terms of shape, size, and color, is often removed from the supply chain. So, often you'll see is supermarkets, and chefs are guilty of this as well, is that when they're ordering their uh, produce, they want the carrots to all be straight. They want the turnips to be a certain size. They want the aubergines to be a certain size. And they won't accept it if they're not perfect. For me as a cook, and, you know, I love cooking. I love my food. And I have worked at very high levels in the industry in Europe. Um, but for me as a cook, and this is where some countries are better than others at this, or some food cultures are better than others at this, it's about taste and flavor. And we as the chef can create the shapes then thereafter, all right? But it should be more about the taste and flavor of the product. It should be the first thing that worries us, not the shape of it or the color of it or the size of it, all right? There's things that we can do as cooks, that's how we train as cooks, um, that can make that, you know, create something really, really nicer on the plate for a, a customer. Um, and a lot of that produce is actually dumped. It's not even sent away to be sold somewhere else at a cheaper rate. It's actually dumped. And that's tragic. There's, you know, look at the internet, lads. There's so many pictures out there of uh, these big bins outside supermarkets and all that kind of stuff, full of food, full of edible food. There's a video clip that I'd like you all to watch at some stage. Some of you may have done it. It's on the website. And it's uh, Tristan Stewart's um, TED Talk. And it's so interesting to listen to this chap and what he's able to do with food and what he's able to do with what's perceived to be poor food. OK, even if we feed it back to animals, we, at least we're producing it and we're using it and we're creating something else. We're creating future food for us in another way, but we're not wasting any food. Um, foods that are close to or at or beyond the best before dates are often thrown away by the retailers and often thrown away by consumers. So a best before date and a used by date are two very different things. A best before date just means that the food is best before that date, but it doesn't mean it's not edible after that date. A used by date is very different. That's you know to do with um, food health and safety, and it's particularly um, associated with protein foods, all right? But best before dates, are exactly that, but people, like maybe we need a little bit more education about food waste and what food waste actually is um, and what we mean by a best before date. 
There's things that we can do with that food. We don't have to throw it in the bin. Um, large quantities of wholesome medical food are often unused or left over and discarded from both household kitchens and eating establishments. And again, anywhere that you're working, or even at home, but definitely anywhere that you're working, it's often good to just go out at the end of the day and have a look at how much food is thrown in the bin. And could we have used it better? Could we have done something with it? Um, a bit like trimmings. You know, what can be done with trimmings? Now, certain things, we you know, potato skins, if we're peeling potatoes, um, there's not much that we can do with that, and that's acceptable. That's called unavoidable food waste, banana skins, eggshells. Um, but actually, there is something that we can do with it. We can compost it. So we might do something with it edibly there and then, but what we can do is we can compost it, and then next season or next year, we have compost available to throw on um, the ground to help grow more food, better food. Um, and therefore, then we haven't wasted it because we are using it somewhere along the supply chain, all right, or that growth chain. So that's one way that we can do it. What do we mean by healthy food choices? So according to the Australian Food Agribusiness Network, food provenance can be defined as food provenance means where your food comes from, its origin. It's also about knowing how it's produced, transported, and delivered to us. Now, what's that got to do with healthy food choices? Well, actually, that's an awful lot to do with healthy food choices uh, because we have adapted, even though we're all the one species, but we've adapted to our own little regions. So in Ireland, we have very high cases of um, celiac disease, very, very high cases of celiac disease. But if anyone thought about the region of Ireland, that's because we've lived on this island for about 10,000 years. And we've adapted to oats and barley. We've never adapted to wheat fully. And that's how it works. So healthy food choices does mean understanding the food of where you're from or where you've been and incorporating that into um, your business and your menus and your dishes you're designing and your thoughts about food. So there's the link with healthy food choices and food provenance. Now, I know you've looked at this already with um, uh, creating local, uh, local foods module. So I'm not going to into, go into more detail on that, but it's just showing you the links when we talk about sustainability um, and sustainability for health is that if we understand that, well, then actually we can create something that suits better for that particular region that we're in and for the consumers that we may have in, the, in that particular region that we're in. So that there's even there's links to that end when it comes to food. Um, and again, we can talk about food seasonality, and I'd be very, very passionate about this, particularly food seasonality. Um, I really dislike strawberries on a plate when they're not in season. Um, it's one of my bugbears, um, and, but I see it so often, not just in Ireland, uh, th um, throughout Europe in particular, and throughout most developed countries. We'll see stuff that's not in season on our menus, and we're wondering, well, how is it, why is it on a menu? Um, is that a lack of knowledge of the chefs that are cooking it? Is that a lack of knowledge of the business owners? Or is it that we just don't care, we want to put it on because that's the dish we're creating? Well, the future career of a chef really should be about uniting the two things. We can still create really good dishes with food that's in season. We just have to become creative. We just have to think that little bit stronger or that little bit better. So according to the Irish Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Food seasonality can be defined as seasonal food refers to the times of the year when the produce, harvest, or the flavor of a given type of food is at its peak or best. And I like that definition because it, it instills in us, as chefs and cooks in particular, our food should be about, our ingredients should be about the flavor and the taste that they have. Well, seasonal food is at its best when it's in season. That's why it has a season. It's at its absolute peak. And that's when it tastes the best. And that means that we're not doing so much hard work in the kitchen trying to create new tastes to cover up for the lack of taste in some of the food that we're using out of season. So it actually makes our life, our job, sorry, our job, so much easier as well when food is in season. Because we don't have to be adding so, much, so many seasonings and 
extra salt or extra spices or herbs to try and boost the flavor. The flavor is there. And all we're doing then when we're creating dishes is allowing that flavor to be released within the dish that we're creating ourselves once it's in season. There's nothing wrong with changing your menus on a regular basis. Or certainly at least, you know, in, in Ireland, we, we, we definitely have the four seasons. There's no doubt about that, you know. So, um, so what's wrong with changing the, the menu three times or four times in the year? You know, a spring menu, a summer menu, an autumn menu, and a winter menu. And they can still be created. Now, some food cultures or some countries are better at doing it than others, um, particularly with sort of down around the Mediterranean countries that we hear about. So you've got Spain, you've got southern France, Italy, the Balkans, yeah, Greece in particular, North Africa, um, and the Middle East um, sort of region around the Levant, that area. All right. Really, really amazing food, you know, but the whole premise of the food is that it's seasonal. And like it's worked around to be seasonal. And um, in Ireland, we have a different climate completely. So we're not going to have tomatoes growing um, out in the fields. Uh, but we have some amazing seasonal produce even in winter in Ireland. All right. So turnips and um, cabbages uh, are available. You know, you, you've got your um, garlics. You know, there's so much food out there. And then you've got your animal products as well. If you wish to have those, they're all year round as well. Um, your dairy, your butter. So like each country does have the availability of foods. And sometimes when it's not made available, what we can do is that we can preserve it. So we can preserve it in our uh, spring, summer and autumn to bring us through the winter. And again, it's only in recent decades that preservation seems to be have gone from kitchens as well, or certainly get, you know, as reduced in kitchens. And maybe that's down to us as teachers that we must teach more about preservation and preserving our food and storing our food properly, preparing it for storage and to bring us through the winter periods, particularly in the northern latitudes where we do have, you know, hard winters or more so in countries like Finland and Estonia uh, than Ireland. We just get rain. So in the winter, we just get more rain. Um, and uh, so like we can still grow things um, in, you know, today in Ireland out here, I think it's about 15 degrees. All right. So, you know, the grass is growing already. People are all cutting their lawns. They've been cutting them for the past three weeks. All right. So um, so different areas have uh, different seasons, of course, and different harshness of seasons. But it doesn't mean that we can't either preserve food or other foods are available to us. And all this leads into what we consider to be food sustainability. And if we think of food sustainability, part of sustainability means food security. So it, does it mean increasing food production? It can, but proper food production. So reduce carbon footprint is a great way of food security. Sustainable sourcing of your food, that's a great way. Prevent avoidable losses of food. That's a really good way to do it. That's stuff that we can do today. Um, uh, fair trade, you can, you know, think about um, organizations that, you know, pay fairly for the produce from the farmers. So we're doing our little bit in that as well, because then the farmer is going to stay in farming and continue farming to produce food that we can use in our kitchens. Uh, transparency and traceability, really important. Where does that food come from? Is it safe to eat? Is it guaranteed? You know, is it uh, healthier options coming out? So when we give it to our customers, our customers all right, is it the healthiest, best product that we can produce? So according to the European Commission, food sustainability can encompass a range of issues such as security of supply of foods, health, safety, affordability is the big one there, quality, a strong food industry, environmental sustainability, um, and in terms of climate change, and that includes in biodiversity and water and soil quality. So again, it really is farm to fork. That's really what it is, is when we talk about food sustainability. How our food comes to us and how it gets to the consumer through us, all the way from the farm to that fork and understanding that process. We don't have to know the ins and outs of how to farm. 
You know what I'm saying? We don't need to go on that, but we need to understand the process and the steps involved. And that makes us actually better cooks and better culinary practitioners. And that would be the whole idea of it, that we become the best cooks and the best culinary practitioners that we can possibly be. All right. So that we try to uh, um, uh, try to aim to be. And, you know, that will make it for a sustainable career then, because we do then enjoy cooking and working with food more. All right. And the more that we know about it, that's what we do. Um, but things aren't really that bad, to be honest about it. Um, certainly in the countries that we have here today, um, or the places where you're studying here today and where you're staying, um, and, you know, a lot of countries are sustainable and more and more are becoming more and more sustainable. Uh, so in 2020, you know, Ireland's a sustainable country, Finland's a sustainable country, um, Estonia and, um, and uh, Basque region there, you know, like, very stable. So anything in green and yellow is good. You know, green and yellow is actually good. Um, so we're doing well, but there's more that we can do. That's the point. There's more that we can do to offset the issues that other countries may have. Okay. And to try and help them become more food sustainable. And we're talking about food sustainability. At the end of the day, what we want to do is feed people and make sure everybody at least has doesn't go to bed at night hungry. You know, that would be the ultimate aim, the ultimate goal. And even if we're chefs inside in the kitchen and a professional kitchen, we can still think of that every now and again, you know, and because that helps us even be better chefs and uh, better careers because more and more people um, will be interested in sort of how food is created, how it gets developed and uh, what we can do to make food better and taste better. And um, then they look more to us as chefs and cooks for that advice, you know? And so that opens up doors for ourselves and in, in our knowledge that we have in what we do as a profession. Now, I'm not going to go through this infographic. That's just there for you. Um, and you can read through it because this is some of the things right now is uh, that the problem with our food system. Okay, and worldwide. So that's a little bit of work for yourselves to do just to read through it. And maybe, you know, you can have Google open as you're reading through it and maybe Google through some of the things that jump out at you. But it's so wide and varied. All right. It really is wide and varied. There's no one solution to this. or there's no one reason why something is happening. It's a combination of many, many reasons. All right. Many, many, many reasons. But we as cooks can just be conscious of it and try to apply it into what we're doing every day. And that's what will make it better for us.